I think that's good for that product. Um, let me uh, give you the physics definition of cross product. Uh, in addition to the, so because the cross product is one of those things that a lot of people do forget, um, or in physics 4A, the kind of context where cross products come up, um, the, it's possible to do them without cross product. So cross product is one of those things that people, depending on <laughs> what previous math or physics class you took, the specific one with a specific instructor, you might not have seen it. And a lot of times, even the people who have seen it, people who take my physics for a, I find that people do forget it. So let me cover the cross product. And I think, uh, it would be good for me to start out with the physics definition of cross product. Because uh, we have a way of defining cross product that's uh, independent of coordinate axis. So if you imagine two vectors, vectors A and B, uh, let me just draw them the same way that I've drawn before. Then this is how you would define cross product. Um, you define cross product by associating a plane with these two vectors. <laughs> it, uh, in fact, uh, all, in most contexts where cross product comes up in physics, you can somehow associate a plane with whatever context the cross product is coming up in. So now the challenge is as you are defining that plane, or I guess in terms of the screen, this plane, <laughs> as you are defining the plane, you need to describe the direction of that plane in terms of a vector, an arrow. So the challenge is how do you associate an arrow, uh, a unique arrow in such a way that you can associate a single plane with that uh, unique arrow. And I hope you can quickly see that if we are picking any vectors along the in the same plane as A and B, then that's a hopeless task because there's going to be an inf so if this is my plane, there's an infinite number of vectors in that plane. I cannot use one vector to associate that with a plane. This is where you have to go out of the plane and realize that oh, it's um, so. If I want to uniquely define a direction of a plane, like imagine a vertical plane where my hand is touching, then a way to uniquely describe that direction, so none of the vectors and lines in the plane will do. But if I have a line that's perpendicular to the plane, then I can describe the plane as the plane that's perpendicular to this line. So that's the starting point of defining cross product. Wanting to define, um, wanting to associate a, a, a single vector with a plane. Now, as you are, so with uh, this plane here, plane of the screen, as you are looking for the vectors that are perpendicular to the plane, you have two different vectors. You have a vector that's coming out of the screen towards you, and you have a vector that's going into the screen away from you. Both the vectors would be perpendicular to the plane. So, uh, but we need a unique choice, a single choice of a vector that'll, that'll somehow work for us. And, um, and that's the place where, uh, so, so far we've relied on geometry. We've relied on mathematics, nothing arbitrary. Um, we are uh, trying to, so, that's where we started. And this is as far as we'll get if we're insisting on nothing arbitrary. And at some point, uh, we have to make an arbitrary choice between two possible directions of vectors. And uh, what matters here is that everyone in the world uh, agrees to <laughs> one particular convention. And it, when I have an um, interactive lecture, this is the point at which I usually ask people, could the people please raise their dominant hand? And most classes, 90% of the students will raise their right hand. And that is frankly where the right hand rule comes from. Uh, right hand rule is a, a way to 
sum out arbitrarily, choose between two possible vectors, choose one unique vector. It's arbitrary, but it's the rule that everyone agrees to. So, so that's, uh, um, that's how it works. But you could do the exact same thing with your left hand. And then that would be left hand rule. And that would be the convention that no one else is using. But, you know, if you wanted to somehow rebuild all the vector algebra, including the cross product using left hand rule, you can do that perfectly fine. Uh, the biggest challenge is getting other people to do the same thing that you might do with your left hand. Um, so, so I'm just going to use the right hand and do the right hand rule. So the role of the right hand rule is just to pick between the two vectors. Um, so you have a choice of either vector that's going into the plane. Um, I hope uh, people remember these notations. Um, the, you have to imagine an arrow. Uh, this is uh, like an arrow tip that's pointed towards you. So it's a, a vector out of plane. And, and this X is meant to um, evoke the idea of a tail end of an arrow. So it's uh, as the vector is going away from you, you see the tail end. So, so we have the choice between these two vectors. Um, do we choose the vector? Uh, they are both perpendicular to the plane. And which way perpendicular do you choose? And with the right hand rule, this is how we choose it. Uh, we orient our right hand. Uh, by the way, there are different versions of right hand rule I, out there. I'm going to demonstrate the one that I like, which is the version that uses the whole hand. There's a version that uses three fingers. I don't like it. Um, it most particularly, it doesn't uh, morph naturally into the other versions of right hand rule you'll see this semester. When you use the whole hand version, it morphs naturally into the other versions that you will see when we get to magnetism. I'm going to use this. Uh, whole hand version, you uh, orient your hand in such a way that your hand points in the direction of a first vector. So as I'm writing down my A cross B, A is my first vector. So I orient my hand towards A, and I orient my hand, rotate my hand in such a way that as I curl my fingers, my curled fingers curl in the direction of B. And okay, this is not doing it, so it has to be A cross B. So uh, I start with my hand pointed towards your right so that <laughs> my direction of my hand matches the direction of arrow on the screen. And when I do A cross B, the direction of my thumb out of screen is the direction of, um, of the, the arbitrary choice that we have chosen to um, use out of the two possible choices. So A cross B gives you a vector out of plane. And try it yourself, pause the video for a bit, and try your own hand, uh, get your um, A in the direction of the vector you see on the screen, and then orient it so that it's A cross B. By the way, I'm doing this from perspective of me looking at the screen, A cross B, and my thumb is pointing towards me, which is out of screen. And um, the amazing thing about right hand rule, whether I do this orientation uh, for your perspective or I do it for my perspective, it actually works out. <laughs> so, so yeah, so A cross B get, so this uh, direction of the thumb is meant to pick between two possible directions, um, one way perpendicular or the other way perpendicular. This pick to one way per perpendicular. So that's a, a part of the definition of that product. So uh, there's a, so, so let me s state that portion of the definition. So I have one definition, which would be um, the direction given by right hand rule. There's no <laughs> real better way to say that in a single written sentence. That's one. And now after you have, so, so the physics definition of cross product, it comes in two parts. And it comes in two parts really because the cross product gives you a vector back. And whenever you are specifying a vector, um, you need magnitude and direction. This is in contrast with the, the dot product. 
because the dot product resulted in scalar. All you needed was the value of that scalar. You didn't know, need to know the direction of the dot product. But with the cross product, there's direction. And the direction is what takes the longest state. That's what, why I've taken 10 minutes to do it. So that's the first part of the definition. The second part of the definition deals with the magnitude of the cross product. So the magnitude of cross product, as a matter of definition, the physics definition, is that the magnitude is defined as the product of the magnitude of the vectors, A and B, and times, oh, right, uh, if these vectors are in space, there's some angle theta between them. And what you're multiplying here is a sine of theta. And if I'm strictly being um, careful here, it should really be, um, it, it should really be the absolute value of a, b, sine theta. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is the, um, this is the second part of the definition of cross product giving the magnitude. And there's um, a lot of ways you can contrast that product, A dot B, with the cross product, A cross B. Um, one is the one that I just gave, <laughs> that uh, that product results in scalar, cross product results in vector. And the other is with the dot product, uh, I made a point to say that these products commute. A dot B is equal to B dot A. And with a cross product, if you apply through these uh, definitions carefully, you will see that they don't commute. I mean, in the magnitude portion, maybe it does. If you swap A and B, nothing seems to change. Okay, let's leave that alone for now. But look at how we describe the right-hand rule. Because as we are applying the right-hand rule, we talk about first vector, second vector. So the order seems to matter. So let me just try applying the right-hand rule, treating B as the first vector. So I'm imagining uh, what would it be B the cross A? Will it be same as A cross B, or will it be something else? Well, let me use right hand rule. So I'm orienting my right hand along the direction of B, as seen by you. Um, and I need to orient my hand so that I can curl my finger in the direction of A. Oh, I guess it's OK. So B cross A is uh, thumb is pointing towards me or from your perspective. The B cross A is into the screen. So B cross A gives you this direction. So B cross A is not equal to A cross B. In fact, um, since the magnitude won't change, uh, what with the B cross A, the only thing that changes is the direction. It's in the exact opposite direction from what it was. You can say minus B cross A is equal to a cross b or this is what sometimes we call um you could call say that they anti-commute that's uh, used more in uh, upper division level uh, places but I guess, I guess the thing to remember is when you swap the order of product for the cross product the sign flips it's uh, it's an implication of the definition as, as defined using right hand rule now, um, so this is what I'm calling physics definition of uh, cross product. And as you are listening to this, if you are thinking, this doesn't seem to have uh, anything to do with the definition I've heard in, um, in the uh, math class, uh, let me show you the connection, how you can get from the physics definition to the version you might have seen in your math class. So the version that you might have seen in your math or other class is if you have um, if you have vectors a and b. So you know a can be represented as ax x hat plus ay y hat 
plus at t hat. And by the way, for the cross product, you do need all three dimensions. You simply don't have a cross product with only two dimensions. That's another contrast with the dot product. B vector is bx plus uh, by y hat plus bg g hat. Um, given these two vectors, the cross product A cross B is, let me see if I can remember the whole thing in one shot. It's going to be equal to AX. Sorry, I messed up on the first. It's going to be um, AY BG minus AG BY. Uh, x hat plus a g b x minus b g a x y hat plus a x b y minus a y b wait wait did I confuse myself here no uh, I I didn't really it, it, a Y B X um G hat. And it doesn't change any of the result, but just so that it doesn't it won't look like I confused myself, let me just uh, swap the order of these two letters. This is a product of uh, two scalars, so they commute. I can swap their order as much as I want to. It, it doesn't change anything. Um and I think depending on my mood, I either write these things the way I've written it for my Y component or as I've done it for my X and Z component. And there's a way in which you can memorize it. That's how I have it memorized. Um, if you see this uh, cross product or outer product in an upper division setting, um, you could actually write this a super, um, um, I guess, uh, you you can um you can use something called the Levi uh C Vita uh symbol uh which is epsilon i j k to um to express your uh cross product this way as the sum uh as <laughs> let me write it out and then I'll just erase it sum of i going from one to three j going from 1 to 3, k going from 1 to 3, and the product that you're looking at is a i b j and uh, the r k hat um, multiplied to the levy tivita symbol i j k. And this is defined in such a way that this is zero if uh, um, any of the three are the same. If i is equal to j, or uh, j is equal to k, or i is equal to k. Uh, if any of these are true, then it's zero. And it's equal to plus one for what's called a cyclic permutation, or cyclic. So that would be things like if uh, i, j, k is um, one, two, three, or uh, two, three, one. You can see how they go in a cycle. And uh, in that case, this is a plus one. And this is equal to uh, minus one for the uh, anti cyclic uh, permutation. That would be like uh, two, one, three. Uh, so it looks like it's going the other way. Or, um, or another example of anti cyclic permutation would be, I think. Uh, let's see, let me write down three, two, one, and yeah, that's also anticipatory. And, um, and that's how I actually remember these signs. So once that I plus a sign, they go in that cyclic order, Y, Z, X, uh, G, X, Y, X, Y, Z. The ones that have minus symbol, they go in anticyclic order, G, uh, Y, X, or X, Y, Z, uh, X, Z, Y, or, uh, I guess x, y, g, and, and uh, y, x, z, or uh, let me, x, y, g. So going in anti cyclic order. Um, so, <laughs> so, okay, um, I promised the connection between this um, 
So even though you might not have seen this, um, the upper division level stuff by Levi Civita symbol, but you've definitely seen the component by component uh, version. This one, however, you have it memorized. There's actually a neat way to memorize this that doesn't involve this uh, weird symbol. Uh, you can uh, memorize this as a kind of a determinant of three by three matrix. There's that method out there. And I think I show it in one of the lectures. You can see it there. Um, let me end uh, by showing the connection between the physics definition and the component definition that you see maybe in your math class. And the way to get the connection is by figuring out what are these cross products? X hat cross Y hat, Y hat cross Z hat, and or, or so it, the, what you, what the, the, the information that would help us draw the connection between the two is what is this cross product? A unit vector, a coordinate unit vector, cross product with another coordinate unit vector. So if you have something like two unit vectors that are the same, like x hat cross x hat, then I hope you can see that, that that's equal to zero. Because um, here, the magnitude will be zero. The sine theta, sine of zero is zero. Now, if you have, um, so okay, so let's say you have x hat, and I want to figure out what is x hat cross uh, uh, y hat. Then, in, so this is the three-dimensional coordinate axis that's usually drawn. So if I say, um, this is my x direction, and this is my y direction, then my g direction will be um, out of the board. And what it really is, is, um, I don't know how often we emphasize it, this is a right-handed axis. That's because um, we use the right-hand rule itself to define our third axis. Because if someone said, oh, the axis, it goes into the plane, not many people would raise an issue with that. You see all three axes are perpendicular to each other. So does it matter what direction G is going? Well, it matters whenever right-hand rule matters. So here, when you have X cross Y, you have the thumb coming out of the screen. So we have to associate that with our positive g-axis if we want our right hand rule based direction of a cross b to coincide with this. So we say, okay, x hat cross y hat is a g hat. And once you have defined your axis um, to be compliant with the right hand rule in one way, then the rest will fall into place. Um, Try this out. Um, try out what you would get if you take the cross product of x hat cross um, g hat. And when you work it all through, you should get, so you know, pause it if you need time. And when you're all done through, you should get minus y hat. And, and there's a few more combinations that you would have to work through. So let me leave this as an uh, exercise for you. So you can actually, so once you have all the relationships between the unit vectors worked out, there should be six of them, basically nine minus three, because three of them involve the same vector twice. Um, so once you have those six relationships, then when you have this A cross B, you are equipped to expand it this way. <laughs> Write out the A vector in terms of its component, AX, X hat plus AY, Y hat plus AZ, G hat. Cross product to it, B vector, BX, X hat plus BY, Y hat plus BZ, G hat. And as weird as cross product is, it still obeys the rule that we said applies to products, the distributive property. 
the distributed property that we described still applies. So you can distribute this AX exit into cross this and cross this and cross this. So there will be nine products in total here. And you can all work them out because it's basically going to be some coefficient times a unit vector plus another unit vector. So this product will be zero because x hat cross x hat is zero. But uh, AX cross product with BY Y hat will not be zero. The cross product of the unit vectors will result in G hat. So um, you have AX times BY times G hat. And in fact, that's this term here. So, and when you have X hat, cross product with the g hat then you have um so oh you have minus y hat and so you have ax times bg or minus ax times bg y hat and that's uh, this uh, term here so you can work this out component by component so considering product of this term with all three terms here i got two of the terms that i have in my cross product formula and you can get the remaining six uh, by considering remaining six no you can get the remaining four by considering the um, distrib by considering distributing this term into the b vector components and this term into the b vector components it's a fun exercise <laughs> um it, well, okay maybe it's not fun um, and and you know this is quite um complex well not complex complicated and um, this is probably the um, reason i uh, prefer the physics definition of cross product because this connects more easily to the physical things you will see so later on when we do magnetic force you're going to see a magnetic field setup and some charged particle that's moving and it's a uh, so much easier to figure out the direction of the magnetic force by using this definition and using the right hand rule rather than using components unless some question gave you the vector components instead of giving you the description of where they point um, so yeah i think that uh, all the time we have to talk about cross product um, i probably should redo a shorter version of this at some point um,